Okay, boy, wrap it up. I'm cold, I'm wet, and I'm busy selling out, so I gotta get backstage to my women and my cocaine. So what else do you want to know? What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA. And today we're here to talk about Black Flag, who, in my opinion, did more to lay the groundwork for punk and hardcore and really just DIY culture in general than any other band. Now, they probably weren't the first hardcore band or probably not even the most popular one, but they very arguably might be the most influential one. Cited as an influence by everybody from Nirvana to My Chemical Romance to Ryan Adams, their label SST Records was basically the blue print for what an independent label looked and acted like and started the careers of bands like Husker Du, Soundgarden, and Sonic Youth, among many others. They were also one of the very first bands to combine punk and metal, starting with their second album, My War, and later to really just completely break the mold of what punk even was, doing everything from spoken word to experimental jazz kind of stuff on albums like The Process of Weeding Out. And of course, Black Flag was also the launch pad for Henry Rollins' career, who would go on to be in everything from Sons of Anarchy to a SpongeBob Square. Squarepants spinoff. But none of that came easily. They were the target of harassment by the LAPD, they lived in basically abject poverty for the entire existence of the band, and they were oftentimes hated and literally physically attacked by their audience for refusing to conform to the rigid expectations of the 80s punk scene. So how did they do it? And what is the lasting impact and influence of Black Flag? Those are the questions that I will answer in this video. And also, UFC fans, we've got a good one coming up this weekend with Makachev and Oliveira in a rematch. You do not want to miss this one. So I've partnered up with DraftKings to bring all of you an exciting new offer. Right now, new customers who sign up with my promo code PUNKROCK and bet just $5 on any of this weekend's matches will receive $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's right, new customers will instantly receive $200 in bonus bets when they bet just $5 on any of this weekend's fights. Stay in on the action and use those $200 in bonus bets on DraftKings Same Fight Parlays for a shot at an even bigger payout. That's where you combine multiple bets together from the same fight, including the number of rounds and the method of victory. And DraftKings is the only place where you can bet same fight parlays. And if sports betting is not yet available in your state, don't worry. You can still join in on the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy. DraftKings is offering huge UFC contests this weekend with massive cash prizes up for grabs. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use the promo code PUNKROCK and bet just $5 on any wager and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code PUNKROCK only at DraftKings. Black Flag started back in 1976 in Hermosa Beach, California, originally called Panic. And just to put in perspective how early that was in the larger context of punk, never mind the Bullocks by the Sex Pistols wouldn't even be out for another year. As Black Flag bassist Chuck Dukowski put it, at first there was no punk. We were making punk music before there was even a name for it. Black Flag guitarist Greg Ginn and vocalist Keith Morris saw the Ramones on their very first tour, got inspired, and decided that they would start a band too. And after failing to find anyone else who would release their music, Greg Ginn decided that he would do it himself and started SST Records to put out their debut release, the Nervous Breakdown EP. I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. My head really hurts. And the punk scene in Southern California was growing, but being from one of the beach cities, Black Flag didn't really fit in. And to put it simply, nobody wanted to book the band to play shows. As Chuck Dukowski said, Black Flag's earliest gigs were self-promoted. Since we had trouble getting gigs, we just made our own. And the point that I want to make here is that although these days Black Flag is basically universally loved and for good reason, throughout their entire career, starting from the very beginning, they always kind of walked their own path, which oftentimes put them at odds with the rest of the punk scene. And they spent the next few years going through several vocalists after Keith Morris quit and started the Circle Jerks, with the first one being Ron Reyes, who sang on the Jealous Again EP. Always on the phone, never leave me alone. Why don't you just tell me what you want from me? Followed by Des Cadena, who sang on the Six Pack EP. They say I'm fucked all the time. Six Pack. I know they're a waste of time. 
And there's a lot of people who think that this is the band's best era, which I totally get because I do love this stuff, but I actually think their later material is a lot more interesting for reasons that I will get to in a few minutes. But with that being said, the band was getting shockingly big given that number one, they didn't even have a full length album out. And number two, that punk in general was still kind of in its infancy with kind of the most well-known example of that being that they somehow managed to headline a 3,500 person show at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium. But although the band was definitely gathering some steam, it was still anything but easy. With the news media hyping up reports of punk violence in general and specifically at black flag shows, and the police harassing them relentlessly, which is the inspiration for the song Police Story. And that is exactly what's always been inspiring to me about Black Flag, about what they were able to achieve despite all of those headwinds. I remember being in high school and reading interviews with them where they would talk about like living in abject poverty, sleeping on the floor of the SST Records office, and working around the clock, putting up flyers for their shows in the hot sun. For example, as Chuck Dukowski described it, we'd sleep on the floor, wake up with the sun. Greg's father would bring down a few sandwiches and feed us pretty much every day. And he'd bring us a load of clothes that he'd found at thrift stores. And probably to most people that sounded awful. But for me, I read that stuff and I absolutely loved it. I was like, <laughs> I want to do that. Obviously, it wasn't easy, but they were scratching out a living, doing the thing that they loved, and they weren't afraid to put in the work to make it happen. And even all these years later, that stuck with me. It's what inspired me to start making fanzines back when I was like 14 or 15 years old. And really, it's indirectly the reason that I'm here on YouTube now. And in 1981, they found their newest vocalist by the name of Henry Rollins, which is when Black Flag's most well-known era began. I'm standing there with the band with a microphone in my hand. They said, pick the tune and I sang every song they had. His first recording with the band was their debut full-length album, Damaged, featuring many other best-known songs like Rise Above. And what's interesting is that that album almost never came out. They'd signed with a label called Unicorn Records, which was part of the major label MCA. And after hearing the news media reports about Black Flag and that the album was quote unquote anti-parent, MCA initially refused to distribute the album. And so facing the prospect of having this album put on the shelves forever, SST eventually decided to just distribute the album themselves, which led to Unicorn suing the band, which is also the reason why the band didn't release another album for three years. But although Damaged is now regarded as one of the best punk albums of all time, and I do think it's great, it's actually my personal least favorite Black Flag album because it's really sort of a transition point for the band. It's not the catchy, straightforward punk of the early stuff like Nervous Breakdown or Jealous Again, but it's also not the weird experimental stuff that was about to come. It's sort of their awkward teen years in between those two things. And speaking of which, this is where things start to get really interesting for Black Flag. Basically, right about the time at which they were probably the most popular hardcore punk band on the planet for whatever that was worth in 1984, they essentially rejected all of that and completely threw out the punk rock rulebook, starting with their 1984 album, My War. My War! In particular with side two of the album, My War is just a complete left turn. It draws much less from the lineage of punk like the Ramones or the Stooges and more from bands like Black Flag and St. Vitus with these like sludgy metallic tracks pushing six minutes long. They also grew their hair out long, which was just totally uncool and unacceptable on the punk scene at the time. As a Rolling Stone article from 1985 said, kids with shaved heads and killed hippies painted on the backs of their leather jackets suddenly discovered that their favorite band now looked like a bunch of hippies. One reviewer called My War, quote, more of a test than an album, which I actually think is exactly what they were going for. As Greg Ginn said at the time, we don't play to satisfy an audience. We play what we want them to hear. It seems like a lot of things that happened in the 60s, freedom, having an open attitude, are being replaced by a new Puritanism. They were basically telling the punk scene, fuck you and fuck your rules. The same thing that Dead Kennedys were talking about in songs like Chicken Shit Conformist around the same time. It was very deliberately confrontational and antagonistic, and their audience responded accordingly, oftentimes like literally attacking them when they were on stage. As Henry Rollins said, it's Black Flag versus the audience. If we played a song 
that the crowd didn't like, they always took it out on the singer. And for me, that meant many trips to the hospital to get stitched up. And personally, for that exact reason, this is the era of Black Flag that I actually respect the most. For their willingness to deliberately antagonize and challenge a punk scene that had become very dogmatic and closed-minded. Which, at least to me, is the exact opposite of what punk should be. And really quickly, before I go on, if you like this video, please subscribe. It really helps the channel and I appreciate it. And behind the scenes, the band was starting to fall apart. With the stress of their just frankly brutal lifestyle really getting to them as a punk band, getting assaulted and spit on every night on tour, sleeping in a cold van, struggling to find something to eat, only to come home broke and sleeping on the floor of the SST office. And also tensions within the band itself mounting, especially between Henry Rollins as the front man and face of the band, and Greg Ginn as the founder and chief songwriter of the band. Nobody knew it, but the band was on the verge of falling apart. But in spite of that, or maybe because of it, they kicked off what I consider to be their most impressive run of really just wild experimentation. Black Flag's next release was Family Man less than a year after my war, and Family Man was an even bigger fuck you to the rules of punk. Side one was all spoken word tracks from Henry Rollins. Family man with your life all planned, your little sandcastle built, smiling through your guilt. Family man. Well, side two was all instrumental which sonically was sort of picking up where they left off with My War, but taking it in a whole new direction that was even weirder. This is like long, meandering, atonal kind of stuff that's somewhere between free jazz, punk, and metal. And also one song clocking in at nine and a half minutes called Armageddon Man that combines the spoken word with the experimental music. And personally, I think is one of Black Flag's coolest songs. Nowhere to go. No place to go. I'm real screwed up. My eyes are sore from smoking all that shit. I remember buying Family Man specifically because of the cover art, which in my opinion is one of the most iconic covers of this era, which is saying a lot considering how cool punk artwork was at the time. And this is probably a good time to talk about Black Flag's visual aesthetics, which played a huge part in the band. Black Flag's logo and flyers and almost all their other artwork was done by Raymond Pettibone, AKA Greg Ginn's brother, Raymond Ginn, who also played bass in a very early lineup of Black Flag. And although I was a little bit too young to really understand all the references in his artwork, the overall message behind it was crystal clear. Beneath the surface of the world where everything looks fine at first glance, there's this dark, cruel underbelly where things were profoundly fucked up and civilization could fall apart very quickly. Raymond Pettibone's art was the perfect complement to Black Flag's music, especially as their sound started to drift away from punk and became more weird and twisted and dark and misanthropic. It's sort of like the misfits where you can't really think about the music without the visuals and vice versa. And once again, this part of Black Flag was a huge inspiration me. I was a graphic designer for about 10 years. I went to school for it. And I think that his visuals were a huge part of what inspired me to be interested in visual art. And they followed Family Man up with Slip It In, which was the third full length album that they released in the year of 1984. Personally, I find it to be the least interesting of those three albums, but at the same time, it's also kind of underrated, especially songs like Wound Up and My Ghetto, which sounds so raw and intense and aggressive that I think if it came out today, it would still turn heads. Which brings us to the year 1985. And you can say a lot of things about Black Flag, but one thing I don't think you can question is their work ethic. While still touring relentlessly, they kept up their insane pace of studio recordings in 1985. First with their instrumental EP, The Process of Weeding Out. And this EP definitely isn't for everybody, but personally, I love it. It's like the instrumental tracks from Family Man, but really pushed to the next level. If I had to pick one song to check out, it would be Your Last Affront, which has the sort of very weird jazzy kind of feel opening the song that eventually just sort of devolves into a wall of sound with those like trademark atonal Greg Ginn solos. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
And I wasn't around at the time to know what punk fans thought of this album, but I can't imagine that they liked it. Greg Ginn often talked about how much he was influenced by the Grateful Dead. And this album felt like his like very dark, strange, twisted take on a jam band. Probably not what the average punk fan was looking for in 1985. And shortly after this, they released their second album of 1985, Loose Nut, which to me is the absolute pinnacle of Rollins era Black Flag. Again, it's like half punk, half metal with a dose of jazz. And it's just incredibly dark and misanthropic. To me, I think of it as like the musical equivalent of if you looked inside the head of someone like the Unabomber, with the song This Is Good being the highlight for me. This is the jazz metal version of Black Flag at its very best. A lot of really weird, unorthodox time signatures, Greg Ginn's just bizarre, chaotic guitars, and Henry Rollins coming off as just absolutely deranged, like he's about to go down to a bus stop and kill somebody just to watch them die. And for their third album of 1985, they released what would end up being Black Flag's final album in my head. And this is an album that pretty much nobody talks about, which I think is a shame because it's actually pretty great. This is where you can really hear the influence of stuff like the Grateful Dead and Mahavishnu Orchestra come in, which is weird because it gives it almost like an uplifting feel in certain places. And yet at the same time, it's also the most twisted, dark and depressed album in their catalog. And although the punk scene may not have loved it, people outside were starting to notice. For example, even the New York Times noticed what they were doing and gave the album a surprisingly positive review. And like I said, although in some ways this album has a little bit more of an uplifting tone to some of the music, at the same time, it's also incredibly dark. You can just hear the toll that the last decade of the band and this lifestyle took on them, and also how poorly a lot of the band members were probably dealing with their own mental health issues. As one reviewer accurately said, healthy people don't make music like this. And all of that eventually came to a head one day in 1986, where just as suddenly as they'd asked Henry Rollins to be in the band, it was over. As Henry later said, Greg told me he was quitting the band. I thought that was strange considering it was his band and all. So in one short phone call, it was all over. Which brings us to the last question, what is Black Flag's lasting legacy and impact? And this part could easily be its own video, but I'll try to hit on the important parts without going on for another 20 minutes. First of all, along with Suicidal Tendencies, they were one of the very first bands to combine hardcore with metal, but where Suicidal was drawing from thrash and playing faster and faster, Black Flag was doing the opposite, drawing from bands like Black Sabbath and St. Vitus, who slowed everything down, laying the foundation for what would go on to become known as sludge metal, and heavily influencing the grunge bands like Nirvana, Soundgarden, and Mud Honey, as well as bands like Pantera and pretty much every hardcore band ever. And I think these days people mostly only pay attention to the early stuff, which is certainly understandable because it's a lot more accessible, but I would highly encourage everybody to check out the later stuff because in my opinion, that's where Black Flag started to do things that even to this day are really original and unique and in my opinion, underappreciated. Second, Black Flag is the reason that SST Records existed. And SST wasn't the first independent label by any means, but at least to me, they have always been the template for what I think of as a DIY punk label, and really the blueprint for every label that came after them, like Discord, Revelation, and Lookout. And I don't think that that is just me. No less than Rolling Stone said that, quote, SST is the most important underground record label in America. And they had pretty good reason to say that with a discography, including bands like The Minutemen, Sonic Youth, Soundgarden, Husker Du, Dinosaur Jr., and The Meat Puppets, among many, many others. And of course, as probably everybody knows, the band was also the springboard for Henry Rollins' career, first with the Rollins Band, which he started immediately after Black Flag. And if you like later Black Flag, definitely check out the first few Rollins Band albums, especially Hot Animal Machine, Lifetime, and The End of Silence. So really what it comes down to is this. If you think about what punk and hardcore and DIY culture means and looks and feels and acts like, Black Flag laid the foundation for just about all of it. 
All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. And also, I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the True Cult level or above. There are members-only channels on my Discord that I'm super active in. I do giveaways. You'll get all my podcasts and videos early, and there's a way to have me review your music. So if any of that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.